Here to tell you why some people's nightmare could be your nirvana, please warmly welcome Gerd Leonard. All right, thanks very much. That was a great intro. Thanks. Okay, here's my iPad. Sorry, no Android. So I'm going to uh, read tweets. It's uh, G, G. Leonhard, G L E O N H A R D. I'll show you in a second my Twitter address. And if I actually get to it, I will try to read your tweets and, uh, and respond. Let me just bring this up here. All right. So uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I live in Switzerland. Um, I was born in Germany. Don't hold it against me, please. Uh, I, <laughs> I lived in America for a long time, uh, for 17 years. I used to be a professional musician. I made 20 records. Uh, I had a real great time as a musician. But in the mid-90s, I jumped on the internet as an internet entrepreneur, made a lot of money, lost all the money, went bankrupt in <laughs> 2001. Um, and basically proceeded in a direction towards understanding what media looks like in the future. Uh, I wrote a book in 2004 called The Future of Music, which is translated in, I think, 15 languages, probably not in Dutch, but uh, that book is actually still selling, which is very sad, considering that it's quite old. Uh, all my other books are available on the Internet for free. I just tweeted earlier a tweet, just uh, look for GERD, G-R-D, and free PDF, and you can download all of my books. Uh, on the internet and read it in ever which way, or don't print it, whatever you'd like to do. So, as a futurist, this is essentially my job. Uh, just a, a question of warning, I didn't become a futurist because I knew what a futurist was. I did not actually know what a futurist is. When I wrote the book, The Future of Music, uh, together with a friend from Berkeley College, uh, people started calling me a futurist because I was always talking about the future. I don't know if that word even exists in Dutch. I don't in German, it's Futurist, same thing. But anyway, I didn't know what it was. People said, well, you talk about the future and media, so you're the media futurist, so I became a futurist. But this is my job, is to listen to stuff that happens. Uh, there's a saying in Chinese that said, if you want to know about the future, ask a five-year-old. And that's probably true. So that's what I do. I ask lots of people what they think about the future. And then I collect the information. And here are some of our clients. You know, I, I run a company called The Futures Agency, we like the CIA for the future, you know, agents for the future, positive agents, hopefully. Um, and we have over 100 clients worldwide, including, of course, big media companies, but also technology companies. And I teach at various colleges and so on around the world. Here's my Twitter handle, G. Leonhard. I don't want you to use your device while I'm speaking, but if you are doing it anyway, then you can tweet or uh, same thing on Facebook. All right, so let's start with this. I mean, we know this is a fact already. It's pretty amazing what's happening around the world is that the Internet is becoming mobile, which means it's becoming useful. The Internet on the computer wasn't useful because it was about work, mostly. And uh, to consume media on a machine like this is not really the kind of experience that we've liked. Also, advertising on the Internet really wasn't very useful because it was mostly skyscrapers and pop-ups and interruptions. Nobody really liked it very much. Now, all of a sudden, we're connecting with mobile devices, and I don't mean iPads or iPhones, because, of course, they're important and they're the first, but very cheap and potentially even free devices in the future. Uh, most Africans will not go online with computers because they don't even have power in many places. Right? They're, they're using cheap mobile devices. Look at the data explosion right now here in 2011. We're somewhere like, um, I think, 200 or so petabytes, which is... Uh, what, one million gigabytes or something, right? And look at the explosion in the future from data. Right? So this data is not generated by CB uh, CBS or, or the BBC or, or MTV or the Spiegel, right? It's generated by the users. Uploading, downloading, sharing stuff, generating media themselves. So now for the first time ever, we're actually also producers of content, even if it's just what's called meta content, which is content about content. For example, if you see a movie, you make a comment that becomes content that goes with the movie. So you see this happening in the future in all different places all over the world, you know, this absolute huge explosion of, of uh, mobile data. So you can say now, looking at the, at the trends here, uh, this is U.S. audience change, 2009-2010. 17.1% more people are watching content on the internet than before. 
everything else is in decline. Okay. This is U.S. numbers. Huh? Uh, U.S. consumers move very quickly. It's going to take us longer in Europe. For example, in Switzerland, people are not at all this extreme. It will take longer. Uh, and of course, in India, it's hard to go online. So, uh, well, not period, but in many places. So it's going to be harder for them. But if you're looking at the worst hit, right, magazines, newspapers, cable television, U.S. So give this 10 years when you are ready to, uh, to start your company, or maybe five years, or you already have some maybe. Right? Basically, if it's not online, it doesn't exist. That's sort of the end of the discussion here, right? So you can see this complete convergence of cable television, magazines, newspapers, and the internet. That's what's happening right now. So it's not that broadcasters will go away or radio stations, but they're all going to merge with what we see online, right? All coming together in this huge convergence. We talked about convergence in the, l in the late 1990s when I was in San Francisco doing my startups, and there was Napster and all the early internet companies, uh, we thought, okay, in two years it's all I online, right? but it was way too early, of course. Right? But all the things that we had discussed weren't wrong, they were just too early. So look in this direction, it's all going online, and basically this is our daily occurrence now, it's complete disruption. Imagine, for example, you run a four-star restaurant in France, in the Guide Michelin, you're in the Guide Michelin, and it's printed every two years, and you have your slot in there, and people come to you, right? But one day, people start showing up with their smartphones, and they don't like the food, and they keep talking about you online, right? On TripAdvisor and, and, uh, and, and uh, Quipe and many other websites, and they share opinions. All of a sudden, your business is declining because you no longer have the control of the audience, which was the book before, the, the Guide Michelin. So disruption is now everywhere, for example, banks, are in deep trouble because now we can exchange financial information online. We can use applications to calculate our loans, right, which lots of people do. There's even an application to get divorced. So if you're a lawyer, you can, you know, you can use this application to help people get divorced. Right? So this, I'm, I'm not using it myself, um, but <laughs> I could have used it years ago. But anyway, <laughs> d disruption. Right? There's disruption everywhere. So this is great for you because only disruption will give you successful innovation. There is no innovation without disruption. Because if you're not disrupting something, you're probably not doing something right that somebody else could do. Right? Take, for example, the most uh, successful entrepreneur in the last decade, really, or last two decades, Richard Branson, right? Virgin. Everything that he does is about disruption, doing something better than the other guys. And he has failed, of course. Right? But in general, that's his sort of mantra, right? disruption. And uh, Henry Jenkins, who runs uh, MIT Media Lab, or used to rather, he's somewhere else now, he says, it's not about technology, it's not about gadgets, it's about emerging cultural practices. How do we buy? How do we get information? How do we share? How do we bank? How do we get education? It's about cultural practices. Everything we do is about culture, it's not about tech. And tech is just the surface of this. Right? So don't look towards computers or geeks or technology. Right? This is about how people are changing in the face of technology that we have. For example, 100 years ago, roughly 100 years ago, a little bit less, we had this invention called the radio. Okay. When the radio first came along, all of the composers, publishers, artists said, this is a very, very bad thing because people can listen to music for free. Right? Not good. So they, they refused to make it legal. And every single person in the country, all over Europe, and especially the US, was using the radio, actually using it without permission. And people got killed over the radio because they were the enemies of the musicians. Right. One day they figured out, okay, 99.7% uh, of the population is using radio and listening to radio. We have to do something. So in the US, this went to Supreme Court, the court said it can't be illegal because everybody loves it. Figure out a way to make it work. And then the court said it's not illegal to have music on the radio, but you have to pay a license fee, which is how composers and musicians get paid by the use on the radio. Today, forward to the internet, same thing, right? It's not good because it's free. Right? But the reality is, Everybody's using it. Everybody's doing things. We have to find a way to license what people do rather than make five billion people change. So I'll talk more about that in a minute, but 
looking at this slide from a good friend of mine, Ross Dawson from Australia. He's talking about when newspapers will stop printing. And as I was saying earlier, the Americans move very quickly with change, so they're first. 2017 is when Ross thinks people will stop printing newspapers, by and large, maybe on the weekend. Right? And you can see this happening right now. The New York Times is thinking about whether they can just print on the weekend uh, and all these things. I mean, obviously, this is a huge topic because 75% of the newspaper budget is not making the content, but the cars and the printing presses and the ink. So the problem with newspapers is not that we don't like news or that we don't not willing to pay for content. The problem is that 75% of the money goes somewhere else rather than the content, right? which we may not like so much. So would you rather pay for a truck driver to deliver the newspaper or for the news themselves? Right? That's, of course, a key question. So here in Holland, right, where he, where you're very safe still, 2027, that's a long time. Right? So you can help innovate. You know, I don't think this is actually quite true, but you know, just sort of a ballpark. In China and the US, in China, 97% of people that are on the web are watching television over the internet. Right? In other words, because many of them don't have cable or satellite, obviously, <laughs> they have to watch stuff like TED.com or Fora.tv or Big Think or, or, of course, YouTube, right? YouTube being the most popular. Right? So this is called OTT, over the top. Right? Over-the-top television will beat cable in the long run. Right? I mean, cable has huge advantages today because you know it's it's nice quality, it's quick, it works, it's it's really easy to use, and so on. But if you see what's happening around the world, is basically the most crucial thing is that this television knows who you are. Right? It's very scary, also, of course. We d maybe we don't want the television to know who we are, depending on what you're watching, <laughs> but. What you see today is that every single television that you buy can connect to the internet. There won't be a television in two years that doesn't automatically connect to the internet when you have a connection. Right? So every electronics show you go to, every television connects to the internet, does all these things. So you can watch television, you can chat with people, you can look at your Flickr photos, like all the stuff where you have to be a geek today to make it work. Right? This will work in the future. And where are all the TV shows coming from for these channels? Right? I mean, today we have, what, 100 digital channels here in Holland, maybe? Uh, used to be just five terrestrial channels. Now we have a million channels or 10 million channels because if you want to watch about yoga all day long, you could do that today on the Internet. Right? It, it works today. Right? So that content is coming from a huge crowd of people. So now if you're a television producer or a film producer, which I also do, I have some movies called Future Talks that I've been working on, we're not looking towards the, the Discovery Channel or the BBC to put this out. We're looking towards Facebook, YouTube, Netflix, Amazon, and many others. So you will see in the future that we're going to see uh, companies like Facebook develop TV shows, which they already have said they want to do. And YouTube has a $100 million fund to create television shows. So that's coming back in the future. You're extremely lucky to be in this period because you no longer have to go to LA to figure out how to make a TV show or to Hilversum for that matter. So it's of course both happening at the same time. It's not either or. So then we have this trend you now th that basically Google has the best embodiment of this trend is that the market value of Google here is actually much higher today, 280 billion I think, compared to the traditional guys in the US Viacom, Time Warner, News Corp, and so on. Look at the market value of Google. Right? Beats all of those guys easily. And Google doesn't even have any content. They don't make any content. They don't make anything. Well, they make lots of tech stuff, of course. Right? And they're the biggest provider of public domain software. Right? They're public, they publish lots of stuff. Right? But their market value is based on this, which is data. Google is the master of taking data from us and turning it around into advertising. Okay. And one thing is for sure, there won't be a future of media without the future of advertising. Because guess what? You can pay for content either yourself, most people don't, or with taxes, which all of us do in Europe, and there's some reasons for that too, right? or with advertising. That's called paid with attention, okay, paying with our attention. 
Did you know how much money is spent on advertising to reach us, to buy stuff? Right? You'd, be, you'd be amazed. Right? The, mobile, the mobile business, mobile phones and mobile networks, is $1.8 trillion. Okay. And the uh, advertising business is yearly $560 billion it's spent in advertising, plus another $500 billion in marketing, public relations, and other assorted promotion things. So it's roughly a trillion dollars. Right? A trillion dollars is spent on selling stuff to us. Take the money of a trillion dollars, right? That's four times the market value of Google. How much is the music business? Anybody know? Answer quickly, because it will change. It will go down the next second, okay? <laughs> right. The music business is about $17 billion, okay? 17 billion. That's 1.7% of the entire global advertising budget. If you don't think that we can support music or other content with advertising, you're looking in the wrong direction. It hasn't worked so far. That doesn't mean it won't. Right? So keep in mind, for example, cable television. If you have the cable come into your house to watch TV, it's a lot more expensive than you're going to pay with your 10 or 15 euros for the basic cable. It costs like 150 euros to get the cable to your door. So the cable guys give you television for free, basically, because they hope that you will buy more. You will buy HBO or the Wrestling Channel or whatever stuff you want to buy. The average American consumer starts with $12 for cable. They end up spending $85 a month. Okay? That's called upselling. You don't start by saying to the consumer, give me 100 bucks and you can watch television. Good luck. So if Spotify says to us today, give me 10 euros to, what, to listen to all the music you want, most of us won't do it. I will do it. I am doing it. Right? But it's 2 or 3% of the population. If Rupert Murdoch says to us, give me a dollar a week to read the newspaper, most of us won't do it. If we make it free and we say, okay, let's find a way to access the content and make it a really big audience and then upsell you to the next level, most of us will do it just like cable TV. So it's all driven by data and by advertising. For example, here paying with attention, most of you I'm sure use Gmail. Many of us do. Why is Gmail so great? Because they have, uh, what, they have 450 people on this team making cool stuff for us for free. In return, they read our email. Right? Google reads our email, and not personally, but I mean, you can see in this example, I have a, a video, I see an ad over here, right? and it's tightly synchronized, it's actually very good. So when I go to Hong Kong, I use my Gmail, it says, okay, here's a great hotel, because Google knows exactly I don't buy cheap hotels and what I like, it's actually perfectly on target, right? because they've been reading my email for the last two years. So what's the deal? I'm giving them my data, in return, they give me free email. That's the deal. So Google makes right now $2.9 billion a month of these tiny boxes here on the right. right? In return, we get all the cool free stuff from Google. That's the deal, paying with attention. And that's going to happen for a lot. I mean, Google is a media company, if you haven't noticed. They're a media company. Right? They're heading in the same direction here. I mean, obviously, Apple is doing the same thing because while we're using the iPhone, we're going to see those cool ads that Steve wants to put in there that look like content. Right? They look like they're completely targeted. Facebook has advertising. You've seen that. I advertise on Facebook. Is, it works great. You see all the stuff that's happening here with Facebook and location. In America, you can log into a Facebook and you go to a mall and they give you free jeans at Gap just for the fact that you've logged in and said who you are. Right? That's called paying with attention. Twitter is a, a, a bar in Germany where you can get a free beer if you tweet about them. I tried it. Beer was terrible, but the tweet worked. <laughs> right. So that's all called paying with attention. Now, if, if you look in the future of media, somebody has to pay for people to create things. Right? Obviously, you know, people want to get paid for what they do. Right? But are we going to look to the consumer and say, as of now, the rules have changed. It has never been that we paid for content flat out, like to look at it. Okay? We didn't pay for newspapers, the advertisers did. Right? We didn't pay for radio, our taxes did. I mean, indirectly we paid, but you know, in a pool. Right? So all of a sudden the rules are supposed to be you pay to watch the newspaper on an iPad. Right? It's not going to work. Because we pay with attention. 
we may decide that we don't like to pay attention, so we pay. Right? We pay with cash. We can do that too. But that's the model of the future. So basically, we're all like this. Right? We're all up there in the cloud doing stuff. Forwarding, recommending, tweeting, rating, Wikipediaing, Amazon reviewing, all that stuff. You'd be surprised how many people do this now. It's about 70% of American kids upload stuff to the web. 42 hours of video on YouTube every minute is uploaded. 26 million pictures of Flickr a day, every single day. So this can't all be fools. I mean, there's a trend here, right? And that trend uh, put forth by the European Commissioner, uh, she says, personal data is the oil of the internet. I didn't make this up, I use it a lot myself, but data is the new currency. And many of us will pay with this kind of data. That's where the money will come from. And right now, we're just in the middle of orchestrating this. So all that stuff will basically be a sort of chasing our data. And it's very important that when we talk about data, we talk about trust, transparency, user control, and value. I mean, this is what Google is giving us. Right? It's amazing. They actually have given us so much that we become suspicious of them. They're too good to be true, actually, because now we're thinking like, just like Facebook, we're saying, okay, uh, we, we kind of trust them, they're sort of transparent, but if Facebook makes a mistake, right, we have them within two hours, we can hammer them. Right? Like last year, they changed the terms of use, that everything we put up there belongs to them. Within 20 minutes, a million people have quit Facebook. Within two hours, it was like three and a half million. Right? And within 14 hours, they came back and said, oh guys, we're so sorry, just uh, we go back. They can't control us. We are we're controlling them. That's quite different than, say, Microsoft right? or the BBC, which in a way we can control but takes longer. So that's what's happening with data. Now, let's talk about a couple of trends that are happening in the digital domain. Um, you know what this device does? It makes uh, two headphones out of one, right? the most popular thing for kids. So we don't have to share the earplugs like this. Right? I have like a dozen of those for my kids. Okay. The bottom line is sharing is now what people do with media. If we don't allow them to share, we can pack it up. Right? Because that's what it's all about. Right? If I can buy an ebook for 12 euros on Amazon Kindle and I can't share it with somebody, at least to a certain degree, right? it's useless. If I buy digital music on iTunes, I can't make a ringtone. I mean, I'm using iTunes anyway, but have you tried this? Doesn't work. We can't share. Yeah, we can give somebody the iPod, that's it. Right. But without sharing with that, so sharing is a default, whatever you do has to include sharing, has to work, and now there's a bunch of laws that I'm sure you've studied. The Digital Economy Act, Hadopi Law in France, Three Strikes, ACTA, and all this. I'm sure you know about this stuff if you've looked at it, right? It's basically the idea of saying if people share stuff on the internet, then when we catch them, they can be disconnected. That's the idea. And there's laws to that effect pretty much in every country now in Europe. Starting with the UK, the most progressive, where all the good music comes from, or used to come from. Right? But there's a great saying by Benjamin Franklin who says, those that give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. I think it's a good reply to this. If you're willing to put me into the same place as China, where I can't do what I want to do on the internet because there's old rules that don't fit, then you don't deserve the new rules. Right. Think about this for a second. I mean, if we're going to get locked up because there's no way to actually legally buy what I want to buy because the price is too high or it's not available, then I'm basically in a position to where I'm criminalized by default. Right. So right now there's estimations that about 96% of all kids in Europe are criminal by default. Right. Because when you click on the link on YouTube where the content isn't licensed, you're also liable for this. When you're cutting and pasting from a newspaper and putting it up on your blog, most cases would make you liable. Using a PDF from somebody, copying an image, recording a stream. Right. So that, that's not a good idea. I think we need to change that. And I think we're heading in this direction. Uh, also a great opportunity if you're graduating from wherever uh, school you're on right now. Right? Basically, this is what's happening. We're heading into what I call telemedia. What that means is the complete convergence of telecommunications, mobile phones, operators, uh, ISPs, and media. So we have a future scenario where we, we will see those parties, content owners, advertisers, 
telcos, social networks collaborating to create a whole new model. A model of where media will go in the future. And that model is going to be based on what I call usage right. So the right to use the medium rather than to copy it, because nobody really knows what a copy is anymore. I mean, today, if you go on the web and you listen to a radio station streaming, every person knows how to record the stream. All of you know how to save a YouTube video. Right? But in theory, YouTube is not delivering. Right? It's not copying. It's just streaming. Right? But in reality, it's the same as iTunes. It's a cheap iTunes, a free iTunes. Right? Just record it. I mean, if you go to a party of kids today, 15 year olds or so, it used to be when you go there, there would be a huge hard drive with 100,000 songs, you know, taken for free, you know, somewhere. And that was a great accomplishment, right? Today, when you go to party, what is it? It's just YouTube. Right? Just play the song straight from YouTube. Right? Or whatever, you know, Groove Shark or, or Spotify even, or whatever, right? But it's virtual. It's, uh, it's about access, it's not about ownership. And the key trend here is that, you know, in the old days, when I, got, when I started on the web, this was the internet, right? And basically the internet was about work. I mean, it was work to actually make it work, obviously, because you had to have this box, right? Today, we live in this world, right, where it's about, it's fun, right? This is, I mean, when you, when you think about media, not think about work. Right? This is the great thing about the iPad and other tablets, you know, we're browsing, right? we're we're looking at stuff. We're not actually thinking about how we can turn it into a slideshow or make money with it or, or whatever, right? It's, it's consumption or participation, right? And then as Kevin Kelly says, you know, we live now in an age where it's people off the screen. I mean, just look around you when you're traveling. There's screens everywhere, even in the train or even in the airplane now you can use your Wi-Fi, right? If you go to Asia, there's QR codes projected onto the buildings. Right? I mean, there's all kinds of things. Now you can go to a shop and you can stand in front of a virtual mirror in Korea and you can put the clothes on and then you can tweet to your friends right? and they will see an image and they can tell you if it's a good fit or not. Right? I mean, there's screens everywhere. Right? So Kevin Kelly, who's the founder of Wired, says, we're people of the screen. And people of the screen are just not the same than people of the book. I hope that people of the book don't go away, right? because I love the book, and I would love you to buy my book, of course. <laughs> or download it for free, for that matter, so go back to the screen. But basically, these people are not the same kind of people. Are we going to go to those people and say, you know what, if you want to buy my book, it's 14 euros, but the printed book is 15 euros? That's not going to work. Right? I mean, that idea is crazy. Right? That's like saying you're going to get less value, because you can't actually trade it, and, and it's not physical, right? Our distribution costs are zero, but we're going to make more money than before and restrict the use. That's not going to work, right? I mean, people of the screen are extreme people, as we can see here, you know, play their like screens everywhere, you know. And then we have this, right? I mean, how many of you, I mean, of course, you're the perfect target group for this. I mean, the like button is the most powerful instrument of advertising you can imagine. I mean, I get, every day I get emails from people saying, can you please like me? Right? And I get tweets saying, I'll pay you $1,000 if you tweet about my product. Right? Like my product. Right? I'm always saying, like, well, if I had to like your product, I have to look at it first, and most of the time I don't like it, so I don't bother. I'd, of course, that would be cut off a million dollars. You can try me, but a thousand. But anyway, um, this is the most powerful advertising message. 86% right? of people buy stuff because other people recommend it. We don't buy things on facts, we buy things based on emotion. Right? If my, my tribe, my peer says this is a great car, I'm interested. Okay? And if I endorse the, next, the, the latest Audi car on my Facebook page, lots of you will look and say, oh, maybe you should take a test drive. Right? I mean, it's stupid in a way, but that's how it works because we're, we're tribal animals. Right? So the like button, is extremely important. So Facebook is building an economy of several billion a month based on the like button. Right? Because imagine if you're a film producer. Okay? Facebook says to you, you know what, if you get 100,000 likes, we'll produce the next series with you. Right? And then Facebook will say, you know what, if you buy Facebook credits, which is the Facebook money that Facebook is just now launching, right? your fans can give you a credit if they like you automatically, which is like 10 cents or something, right? 
So this is like Kickstarter or Seller Band or so, but inside of Facebook. Right? So you can click on the like button and you can raise 100,000 euros for your next movie. This sounds like theory now, but just give it two years, we'll have this. But be warned, of course, it's extremely hard to get money from people in this way. Right? It's in principle, it works, and, and Kickstarter is a great example. Kickstarter has raised $40 million for 27,000 projects. So it's very hopeful. It's not a, a, a fix-all magic wand. But it so we're going to this world of where basically people are going to say, you know what, if I want to watch a movie, I'll use whatever screen is available, as long as I have a central place to where the movie resides. So most of people today will not accept that they have to watch Tatort on the German show or Derek or whatever old people watch in Germany, like myself, right? at quarter after eight. I mean, that's a stupid idea. Right? To be on the schedule of the television, so you have to finish your dinner in time so you can watch television. I mean, you have to be over 50 to accept that. Right? <laughs> right. We're not going to live in this way. We're just going to say, well, you know what? I have 50 screens. I'm in the car, on the airplane, on my mobile phone, on my gaming device, on the HD screen, and whatever I have access to is going to show up in all those places, right? on all different screens, depending on what I do. And of course, the most important part, all the stuff that we do is in the cloud, up there somewhere. It's not going to be on this box over there. Right? Cloud computing. You've heard about cloud computing. Right? That's the most important part. So the, our world is going to look a little bit like this, right? We'll have endless choices. And this is the tough part. Because when you have endless choices, right? It used to be when you go to uh, London 20 years ago or so, you couldn't actually eat in a lot of different places with all fish and chips and pizza, maybe some Greek food, right? That would be it. Right? Today, when you go into London, you have the most amazing choices of restaurants, you know, anything from Afghani food to whatever you can find, right? So you have this. Right? So it's extremely difficult to get a big audience when you have thousands of different channels. Right? So we have fragmentation, we have aggregation, but most importantly, this is your choice if you're in the media business. We can't watch 100,000 movies a month. There's no time for all these things. There's no time for all the tweets, all the Facebook updates, all the emails, all the SMS. We have to select, right? we have to filter. So today, it's no longer about distribution, because distribution is plenty. You can watch free or illegal, or it makes no difference. You have all of the choices all the time. Now it's about selection, relevance. The average person, studies have shown, listens to 40 new songs a month. 40 songs in music. That's sort of the range, the human range. Now, why does it matter if I have access to 10 million songs or not? I just consume 40. Makes no difference. Why do I need to buy the 40 songs? Can I not just have access to 10 million and use 40 songs? Because I can use whatever I want then. Right? This is what we have in cable TV. So curation is going to be the key factor. Curation, relevance. I mean, in Western countries, we're more starved for time than we are for money. That's kind of sad, actually. but. That's the truth, right? I mean, basically, we're not so much worried about spending a euro. The average person with an iPhone spends $4.80 on apps every month, downloading, you know, divorce apps or whatever, and uh, niche companies as well. I hope you don't know Farmville. Uh, it's very addictive, you know. I showed it to my kids, and they're playing it all the time, which is kind of too bad now. They should show it to me, rather, but anyway. So... Farmville is an amazing game. It's owned by a company called Zynga. Last year, Farmville made $360 million. It's a free game. How do they make $360 million? You can buy a virtual carrot or a tractor, I'm sure you know. Uh, you know, it's, it's gamification, right? So basically, our society is becoming involved in all kinds of games. That's called gamification. This is a key word for the future of media. Right? Make it a game, you'll make it successful. Right? Education will become games. I mean, games in a different way, of course, right? but there's already lots and lots of games that you can play to learn things. Right? And that's going to be the future as well. I mean, if you look at this direction, Foursquare is essentially a game. Anybody here on Foursquare? Location is a game, right? We become mayor, we do all these things. right? It's a game. Is it real? Yeah, it's sort of real, but it's also a game. And Facebook, in a way, is also a game. Right. And that's also the reason why we can't take it too serious, by the way. 
right? Like Twitter, in a way, also is a game, right? Because we're gaming it, so to speak, by retweeting and doing all these things. That's why we can't take it too seriously. It's not exactly the same as real life. Right? I mean, there's a lot of overlap there, but it's also a bit of a game. So this shows the future essentially will be a combination of sort of the real life stuff and what I call gamification. For example, there's lots of advertisers who are now creating games based on things. For example, uh, you have to go and find the uh, Red Bull sticker somewhere that's hidden in a place that's published on Facebook and, uh, and so on, and uh, yeah, all these kind of ideas. Huh? So that's definitely happening in the future here. Uh, I discussed this earlier, all content is moving into the cloud, so if you're a TV producer or film producer or publisher, that's the direction that it's going. Amazon uh, six weeks ago announced that it allows its users to upload things into cloud and listen to music everywhere. And of course, the music industry and their, and their eternal wisdom, they went and said it's not legal to do that because it's fun. You know, that can't be legal. So uh, all content is moving to cloud regardless, right? And basically what we have now is we have this whole debate about copyright. And I want to touch on this topic because it's crucial, right? It's academic. The question is totally academic. Okay. First of all, everything we do on the web creates a copy. We don't have to say we buy a copy, right? Then, in theory, of course, all rights holders have the right to refuse the copy. So when you make the copy of the YouTube video, in theory, somebody else can say they don't allow it. But in reality, that right is academic because you can't enforce it because nobody's going to talk to you about one uh, rip from a stream, right? So what we're seeing right now with services like Spotify, Simfy, and uh, Paperly and Flipboard. Anybody know Flipboard here? Uh, it's a really great app for the iPad where you can make your own newspaper out of Twitter and Facebook. Right. And there's a key question there. When you're sucking off somebody else's content from the web through RSS feeds like Flipboard does, is that legal? Right. Should that be legal? Do they have a copyright? Right. So we're moving now into a world that's much more about what I call usage right. It's the idea of saying, you know what, I'll allow the use of it because I want to share the revenues. Right. Why are the record labels allowing Spotify? Well, at least in some countries, you know, of course, they're giving it a very hard time across the board, but <laughs> I think it's okay in, in Holland, right? You have Spotify, right? Yeah. So they're allowing it because they're saying, you know what, if people access the w uh, our music and many of them become more interested and buy other things, that's good for us, right? in theory, right? But they don't like the idea to be worldwide, so it's only like five or six countries that are blessed with Spotify right now. Right. So we need to get away from the idea of saying we can use copyright to prevent the change of business model. Right. That's a very bad idea because it will certainly kill you. Because right. what you're doing here is you're using something that in principle is yours, but in reality, everybody finds a way around it. I looked yesterday, there's 1,450 websites where you can stream motion pictures, the latest releases for free. Stream, not download. Right? You can watch the movie online for free. I mean, all of you know how to do this. Right? I don't have to tell you. Right? So the fact that I'm not making a copy does not mean that people aren't watching your content for free. So you haven't downloaded, you're not guilty. You have just streamed, you're half guilty. It's like, Does that make any sense? It doesn't make any sense. Right? So. We have to move to a new rights regime, a web-native way of looking at this problem. Which brings me to the key issue. Uh, all of you, I'm sure, are on Facebook. I think it's about 45% of Dutch people are on Facebook, 33% of Swiss people. Uh, this is a graph of Facebook showing how people are connected in which countries. Um, 650 million people. Uh, as of yesterday, 21 billion minutes spent on Facebook. 21 billion minutes. That's every fifth minute on the internet. Okay. And so now social networks, and this is not just about Facebook, there's 10 others like Facebook, like QZone in China and many others, right? So these social networks are the next broadcasters. Right? They're the next people who will connect us for watching stuff. What is Facebook broadcasting today? Us. Right? We're sending stuff to each other. That's what Facebook is doing. Now, Facebook will go public next year on the stock market. It's supposed to be the biggest IPO, the initial public offering ever in the history of the, of the market. Right? So get ready for that next year. I think they will probably raise $100 billion. Okay. 
Now, if Facebook gets that money, and they will, and they already have quite a bit stashed away, they will buy a TV license. They will buy a radio license, they will become a broadcaster. You'll have the music right next to your friends list for free. Because guess what? What you're doing on Facebook creates so much data that they can sell advertising around it. Okay? So Facebook can say, you're a 14-year-old girl, you like the screaming pumpkins, smashing pumpkins, whoever they are. Right? Then they can define a profile of who you are, right? and they can put it together, and they can target you also by location and by all the stuff you've written, and they can get 10 bucks from an advertiser to click on the ad. Right? So that kind of stuff will easily pay for, for music. I mean, if you're looking at these stats, what people like to do, clearly make friends, organize events, play online games, interact with people, all that stuff, music and all these things. So that's the perfect network, right? So if you're VPRO or the BBC or, or ZTF or Arte, that's going to be your main competition. Right? And that's, of, as a creator, this is our major chance of getting distribution. That's completely different than what we had so far. And then there's all these discussions about you know, online and offline. So basically, you have to realize, especially because you are still looking very much into the future after you get out of school, there is no such thing as online and offline. Right? Offline is a mental state. Right? It's not a technical state. Right? So you don't want to be bothered. You turn off your phone, whatever you do, which I recommend you do occasionally for a couple of minutes per day. No, just kidding. Um, then you go offline, but it's not a technical question. Right? There is no such thing as the cyberspace and meat space, which is what we have here, right? Meat space or whatever that means, but uh, it's this whole combination of things. It's the same thing. Real life is the same than virtual. It's the, sa it's the same space, right? Now people are actually liking stuff. In Israel, you can go to a fun park, you go down the slide, you hit your, your button, and the button says, I like the slide. It's an electronic button, and it shows up on your Facebook page saying, I just went down the side with a photo of you, if you want. Right. So complete convergence of real life and offline. Um, so if you're looking at this way, I mean, you've seen this graph already before. Facebook was becoming as powerful and as important as Google. I think Facebook will make more money than Google. Yeah. And there's enough room for that because it's about social connections. It's about tribes. Right? Google is about data which is less about us, but more about what we do. And Facebook is about connections. So they go together very well. It's too late for Google to buy Facebook, but they will probably buy Twitter as a consequence. So see this happening already, you know, Alicia Keys has a place on Facebook where you can buy her music. I mean, if you're not streaming it for free, you can buy it, right? Um, Amazon connects to your Facebook friends. Now, if you want to find out what your Facebook friends are buying, you want to publish what you're buying, you can connect with them and then you get this screen to make it all the other guys that you connected with and see what kind of books they've purchased. And this has brought up Amazon's revenues by 10%. Right? This is a feature that a website can build within three afternoons, basically. Right? It's an API. Right? It's connecting data. So here, for example, uh, Avril Levine, same thing. The BBC has, of course, lots of things. Al Jazeera, the TV show, uh, the TV channel, you can watch on Facebook. You don't need cable TV to watch Al Jazeera. Right? Just watch it there. So, I mean, that's the trend. Facebook as a platform, the symphony orchestra. You can watch Batman now. Of course, you have to pay Warner Brothers for that. Right? But guess what? Now you have to pay. The future will be you don't pay. Facebook will say, you know what? If you want to watch the movie, you're welcome to pay if you want. But here's another option. You can opt in to hear from Audi. Or you can get a multimedia message. Or you can watch this trailer or you can log into the location and go for a test drive, and afterward, you watch this. Right. So all kinds of options of paying with attention. Zook, you've seen the movie. The movie is nothing like the real life, by the way, but it's still an interesting movie. Right. He says that he expects his company to make billions and billions of dollars turning the TV, news, film, and music business upside down. It's good for you. There's a lot more Facebooks right now than there are big cable TV companies gearing up for this kind of future. So Facebook is the next cable TV. And not just Facebook, but all the other ones like it, like QQ, Mixi, Orkut, and, and so forth. So yeah, we have to get ready for the Facebook monster. There's lots of good things, a lot of bad things about Facebook. But if you talk about the future of media, you cannot possibly avoid talking about Facebook, obviously. 
Right? Uh, the other thing that Zook said, which is interesting, it says, we have the most powerful distribution mechanism that has been created in a generation. He did not say, I have the most powerful way of connecting with strangers or wasting time or whatever you want to call this, right? It's a distribution mechanism. And what is Facebook distributing is our attention to each other. Right? That, that's the distribution of Facebook. Right? So that's a, the way that we have to look. And this is one most important thing that's happening on Facebook. It's also helping us to go from the idea of ownership to access. Now let me ask you about this. If you're thinking about buying a new car, okay, who, who here has not considered alternatives to buying a car? Uh, not the train, I mean having somebody else's car. Car sharing. Right? Car sharing and car renting and leasing and all this stuff where you, where you don't actually own the car is the biggest growth industry in the car business. And in transportation, the biggest growth industry is not cars, it's bike renting. Right? Every city now has bike rental programs. That's the biggest explosion in transportation innovation. So now you have about 50 companies around the world who are saying, don't buy a car, share a car. Right? You can share your own car, you can share somebody else's car. It doesn't matter because you don't have to own it. You can access the car. That goes for houses. Right? You can swap houses on the internet. I've tried it. Or couchsurfing.com, uh, you know, you can go to somebody else's house and swap that, right? So that sort of thing is basically happening. So around the world, we're making this move from me, which is, you know, the, the central place, you know, the, the central monopoly entity that broadcasts, you know, Disney, Universal Studios, the big broadcasters, which is not bad, but now, all of a sudden, we're in the age of we. All of a sudden, I am interested in seeing your Flickr feed. I want to see which YouTube movies you like. I'm reading your tweets. You're reading my tweets. We don't need the BBC to moderate our tweets. We do it ourselves. Right? So all of a sudden, we're going from this idea of the central entity to the decentral entity. And guess what? The future means we have both. This is where it gets confusing for media companies, right? Because they're thinking like, okay, they are solidly in control of our destiny. When you actually watched MTV or VH1 in the, in the past, or Star Television in Asia, they curated the list. You didn't have a say on what person was going to show up on the next clip, or maybe you could call in sometimes, but basically you didn't, right? On YouTube, we make the playlist. There is no central playlist, right? There is no central broadcaster, right? So we're going from the world of the network, you know, the big TV station, the big broadcasters, the big brands, to the world of the networked. And this, again, the confusing part is it's not either or. It can be both. Broadcasters will not die. Big companies won't die. But all of a sudden, these guys have to also say, what are we going to do about these people? Yeah. CNN is the best example. What do you see on CNN most these days? It's not taken from the reporters that are out there getting paid. It's from the users. A million uploads a day on CNN, tweets, photos, and images from the users. CNN is still valid only for one reason, is that they've taken in what people are doing themselves. Right. They work with Twitter, they work with video calls, they use Skype on television. Right. Al Jazeera. Right. All broadcasters will switch to incorporate this process. And if you're a broadcaster, if you don't do this, then you become irrelevant, you just go away. Right. Of course, one argument why we pay taxes in Europe is that we have the benefit of curation and professional use, but it has to connect with this as well. And if we don't have that, then also we are, you know, we're going to get dissatisfied from this. So we have this idea from one to many, which is the past of media, and to some degree also the future, to the idea of many to many. Now, you can argue the idea of many to many means there's lots of garbage. Because we, we produce lots of garbage. I mean, basically, Twitter is about 99 point something percent garbage, right? I mean, if you, if you don't have a filter, right? It's noise, right? You choose to listen to me because I may have less garbage or I listen to you and then we, that's how we filter, right? But basically in a many-to-many -many world, it's going to be a lot of noise. So we need these guys, the one-to-many, to help us with the filtering. Right? We need both. Because the filtering takes a lot of skills, right? So basically it works this way this way as well as this way, for example, MTV and YouTube, 
actually work together quite nicely. I mean, I don't watch MTV anymore. <laughs> you probably don't either, right? But they still have advertisers, which is amazing to me, considering what YouTube did to them. But anyway, so we have, we're actually moving in both directions. So that's good news and bad news if you're a big company and an incumbent media company, right? You've got to get into the network model. But on the other hand, if you're only a network company, you have to also become more central and do more curation because otherwise it's too much noise. Yeah. So it's sort of, we need both. I was talking about this earlier, the uh, one to many. You know, we have relied heavily on copyright in the past. So the record labels would say, well, if you, uh, if you rip something from the CD, you pull it up on the internet, that's not legal, clearly. But today we have this thing to where we say, okay, well, we have many to many, and the, the principle there is that it's okay to use it. Like MySpace had, had this principle. Right? It was okay to upload and share on MySpace and on YouTube, which is sort of okay, but not legally okay. Right? But basically the money, this is the important part, right? This is where all the money was in the past. Copyright and enforcement of copyright. But in the future, the problem is if you keep on doing this, you'll basically cease to exist because every, all the action, all the stuff with advertisers, all of the attention is moving in this direction. So the money is also moving up here. So in other words, the television studios, the publishers, the record labels, the authors have no choice, and they are seeing this right now, than to say, you know what, it's better for us to be a part of a system to where we can monetize in what's happening here than to stay in this corner and wilt. Right? Because if we can't be found, we don't exist. Right? Most of the paywalls of newspapers, they're attention walls. Okay? So in other words, if, if you put your stuff behind a paywall, you lose 90% of the potential visits, which of those 50% you could convert to pay. Can it work? Yes. Well, it works for the Wall Street Journal and for Barron's. Yes, okay, that's cool. But in general, probably won't work. The Times in the UK has lost 87% traffic by putting up a wall to the free content. So we have to be smarter about how this works in the future. And I see a new kind of value exchange here. And I think that's sort of our daily uh, routine already. How much more time do I have? I'm going to speak till... Okay, good. And then we take questions, right? Okay, so we have a new kind of value exchange. This is you guys, if you haven't recognized yourself, right? So <laughs> we, we want to pay attention to what is important to us, right? And here is the content that we want to see. So some, some mechanism goes, happens between those two things. Right? That's how we connect, right? But the reverse is also true. The content guys want to connect to us, right? And this is the value exchange. If we pay attention to them, we get something in return, right? We're actually having an important function here uh, in the future as well as just paying. Right? So, talking about how to get paid. Shelley Palmer is a, a TV expert from New York. He said something very powerful and very simple. That's usually the case. He says there's three ways to get paid. First way is I pay. So, when I'm blogging and you read it, I'm paying for you to read. Right? In other words, you pay attention to me, I'm paying because I've spent my time, I have to pay the blogging platform or whatever. I'm not getting paid, I'm paying for you. Right? That's I pay, the blogger. Right? The second one is like the Times, New York Times has tried or is trying a couple of weeks ago. You pay. New York Times says if you come to our website more than 12 times a month, you can't get in unless you pay. Right? That's you pay. Right? I call this the my way or the highway approach. Friss oder stirb, as they say in German. Right? That means you pay or you go away and fuck off and don't exist. Right? So the next one right, is the they pay approach. This is the very first ad you saw on American television from a watch called Bulova. Okay. They pay. What does that mean? Somebody else pays for me to get something because they want to also get to me. Right? That's called advertising. Marketing, advertising, promotion, sponsored, branded content, whatever you want to call it, somebody else pays. 78% right? of all content and media has been paid for by they pay in the past. And I include taxes here, right, if you want to talk about taxes. So there's a, a, a blended model that's coming up, just like it has always been in the future. Right? Think of a blender, this nice blender, and stuff these things in there. 
okay? And depending on what kind of company you have, who you work with, what your audience is, you blend the model. Huh? Sorry, the blender isn't working here, sorry. It was supposed to blend, but it's not blending. Anyway, uh, you have to switch, the, hit the button and blend the model because it's not as easy as saying there's a recipe. You should charge for newspapers. You should not charge for newspapers. You should charge for apps. You should not charge for apps. It's not as simple. I wish I could give you a recipe, but the fact is that it's different in every culture, for everything that you do, for every magazine, for every product. Right. There are places where you can say, you know what, you should pay. Example is the most popular movie service in America called Netflix. Don't try it, you can't get it over here. Netflix uh, offers you for $10 a month a subscription to all of the movies streaming over the internet on all devices for 10 bucks a month, unlimited. And you can also rotate DVDs coming to your house, right? 10 bucks a month. Why are people doing this right now? 22 million people a month are subscribing to Netflix. Right? That's 220 million a month in income. They have this model, you pay. Right? And why does it work? Because it's a low amount, gives high quality content, it's reasonable, 10 bucks a month is like less than cable television, which is 50 or 60 or whatever, you have all the choices, it works, right? it's reasonable. What would be the amount for music? Take a guess. The amount where all of us would say, I'm definitely paying for music. Give me a guess. Huh? A month. Come on, you're kidding yourself. <laughs> that would be nice, right? It has been established as one euro a month. Right? If all of us in Europe paid one euro a month, Right? That, that would be like the lowest. I mean, we could make it two or even, right? That would be 850 million euros a month. Oh, it's almost a billion euros a month. 12 billion euros a year, which makes it already more than half the size of the entire global music industry. Right? Why are we not allowed to pay a euro a month? Because they think it should be more. Right? So it's a question of finding the mechanics of I pay, you pay, they pay. And what's the price point, right? I mean, it's obviously crucial. Uh, I'll skip this because... We're running a little bit out of time. I want to take some questions, so I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. And uh, as you can see, I was planning to be here you know, next week. <laughs> okay, you, hear, you see the tremendous success of the International Federation of the Phonographic Industry, my favorite peeve. Um, I've written two books about the music industry, and I got tired of it, and I put them in the garbage. Um, the music industry has achieved something very important, which is a 71% decline of revenues in 10 years, as you can see here. Right? And why is this? Right? Think about the music business. Right? Do we hate music? Answer, no. Right? Are we interested in music? Definitely. Right? Are we cheap criminals? Most of us, no. Right? Are we looking to defraud the, the, uh, the artist? We're not. Right? Uh, don't we, we don't have mobile devices. We do. So what's the problem with this curve? Uh, clearly, we're people of the screen. We're different. We're not going to accept the fact that we're going to buy music like 30 years ago, which is a Euro song. Uh, some of us are doing that, but most of us will not. Right? Because we're different people now. We're, we're looking for different ideas. Right? Now we're looking to go from the copy to access. Right? I mean, if we can have this, right, if every subscriber on Vodafone or whatever a mobile phone company has access to Spotify bundled together with your subscription, nobody would complain. Is there money in this? Yes, there's plenty of money in it. I mean, we're going undeniably from the copy economy to the access economy. So if you're making a business plan for world domination for your company in the future, right, it's about access. It's not about selling copies. So here's a smart guy, Kevin Kelly again, right? He says, when copies are free, you need to sell things that can't be copied. And I'll tell you one thing we have to face in our future of media, copies will be free. Free meaning available, and you can't do anything about it. Anything that's digital will go up on the web. I was in Russia two months ago. I went to a factory where they're scanning every single book ever known to man, scanning with the machine and giving it away for free on the Internet in return for advertising. A 500k download of any book you want for your Blackberry, Nokia phone, whatever you want, free. Right? So if your model is to sell copies, you're in deep trouble. Right? 
if the publishers are going to look to sell 13 euros worth of a copy of an e-book, they'll get one or two percent of the population, people like us, you know, faithful believers, to buy. But it doesn't solve the problem. We have to sell something that can't be copied, and Kevin Kelly calls this the new generatives, the new way to make money. And this is his list. I'll give an example of immediacy. Uh, when you go to a concert, you've paid for the concert ticket, you go to the concert and they are recording the concert and when you leave, there's a QR code or, or link that they send to you that says, for one euro, you can download this show that you actually attended live. You can download it just by clicking on the link for a euro. Last year in America, this business was $350 million. Buying cop copies of concerts that you actually went to. And even better, let's say you're, you're, um, uh, you're a, a, a fan of a band, then when you go to the concert, you can subscribe to all of the concerts for 10 euros for the year. I mean, if you're a fan, you'd definitely do that, right? But it's currently not possible because there's lots of issues about what you should be allowed to have this concert and how and so on and so on. You know, all the BS that we have to put up with, right? But there's loads of money in this. All right, for example, the interpretation. There's already Chinese versions of Robbie Williams singing in Chinese. Right? You can pay extra to have it in Chinese. Right? Right? That's your interpretation, individualization, right? It's all the other stuff that will make the money. Um, in Denmark, there's a service called TDC that you may know. TDC is a mobile operator and an internet service provider. They have solved this problem in Denmark. They have simply said, you know what? If we put music for free, into the DSL connection and into the mobile phone. When you sign up for TDC Mobile, music is free. Unlimited as much as you want, same at home. They paid something like 15 million euros or something like that to the rights holders to get the license. And now what they have achieved is really quite simple. People who are signing up for TDC, sorry, more important part is down here. The churn rate, people leaving the ISP or the mobile company has been reduced by 50%. So people stay with this company for the DSL service or the mobile service because they have free music. And guess how much that is worth, 50% churn reduction. And do the math, 50 million. Right. So they've spent 15 million to get music for free and they make 50 million. Right. That's a great argument for those guys. This is going to happen in every single country around the world. Right. It's cheaper for them to give you music for free than for you to leave the company and go somewhere else with your mobile phone. As I was saying earlier, data is a new oil, right? This is the example. So that's the kind of problem solving we're going to see in the future. We've already discussed this, so I'm going to give it a quick wrap up and then we'll take some questions. I swear I'll stop now. You know. So, okay. Sorry, I have a few more slides here. but Okay, uh, two more things that people are asking me about. I think this is important. People always say, you know what, you're talking about advertising and stuff, but you know, who, nobody likes advertising. Because advertising used to be about interruption, garbage, noise. Right? Now advertising will become meaningful. In other words, when you at Skip Hall Airport, somebody will say, okay, you, they know you got up early, you want a coffee, you get a coupon. A company called Groupon, they're doing this already. And this coupon will get you 40% off the coffee. You appreciate this ad because you want a coffee. Right? But how do they know? because you shared something that makes them understand where you are and what you're doing, right? So this kind of advertising, you know, the watering can, that would be like having a huge billboard of McDonald's in the middle of the airport saying, drink coffee, right? That's the watering can. Here's a sprinkler system. They know you're leaving at 6.45, you, you've just used the taxi or the train, they have the data and they can give you an offer, right? That's the sprinkler system. This is dumb advertising, which is what we used to have, and this is smart advertising. Okay. This smart advertising is based on data, which can be quite scary for them to actually know that you want coffee. It could also be scary, right? But that's sort of the deal, right? So the future will be stuff like this. You know, you don't get a BMW ad uh, wh when you're in Nairobi and you're making one dollar a day on your mobile phone. You're, you're not going to see that. Wouldn't make any sense, right? You get to make films with a Ford Mustang, right? That's the ad. You get to participate in the film, right? So advertising is going beyond interruption. This is very important because if you're looking at this slide from Kleiner Perkins, they're saying basically on the mobile phone, advertising is extremely powerful. 
Right? It's relevant, it has reach, it's viral, it allows transaction. This is crucial because if you ask them the question where money is coming from, clearly this advertising will deliver the money. Right? As I was saying earlier, trillion dollars a year. So a quick summary, all content is moving into the cloud. If you don't like this, too bad. This is basically what's happening. Right? When it moves into the cloud, whole different rules apply. And you can say you don't want to build the cloud, you don't allow it, but that's a theory, right? That's in, yes, we can say that, and we have said that many times, but it has not been fruitful. We cannot prevent sharing. If you prevent sharing, your business model is doomed. Look at iTunes, right? Has worked out great, 17 billion downloads, but people stop buying. People stop buying every single country. People stop buying eventually when they've spent 500 euros, they stop buying. It's going from the broadcast to broadband, from the tower, to the people broadcasting to each other. Right, broadcast and broadband are sort of two different things. Social networks are the next broadcasters. If you're not using social networks to broadcast whatever it is that you're doing, you should. There will be Twitter television before too long. Right? Of course, YouTube and all the existing channels are important as well. We're going from copyright to usage right, which is an extension of copyright, just to be sure. It's not a redoing, it's an extension, just like the broadcast license from the network to the networked. Uh, we need to create a different legal framework. This is crucial because we can't always say we're not ready. I mean, we, we have not, not been ready for 15 years since the days of Napster, right? We can't just sit there and say we're not ready yet. Right? We have to create a new legal framework that makes money rather than stipulates a paradox. Okay. Now it's a fight for attention, not for distribution. Uh, the media business is not about saying who has the most powerful tower or the longest cable or whatever you want to say about infrastructure. That's still important, obviously, for the few more years. But now it's about attention. Who has the audience? Right. And if you're a creator, if you're actually a creator, a filmmaker or a musician, right, it's the audience. Right. If you don't have the audience, you're finished. Right. No matter how much money you want to make without an audience, that's it. Right. You'll never make any. I can assure, as a musician, I've noticed. So we're going from ownership to access. That's the business model of the future. Here's my business models. They're free. Right. All these books you can download. I think if you're into music, you should try this one first. And my latest one is called Friction is Fiction. And I have an app, of course, that you can download for $100 a piece. No, just kidding. It's also free. So um, my first book isn't free. <laughs> I went with the publisher on that one. Uh, no comment, though. Um, Anyway, so that's it. You want to take some questions? Let's do that. Okay. Well, Look at my tweets. You had this audience's attention, so a big round of applause for now. Thank you. <laughs> we have questions. Let's do them fast. Uh, get to the um, microphone, if you like, and share your question. Or oh, we have a mobile one. Very good. Yeah, yeah. I had a question. You know uh, Yoast TV? Yoast TV? No, Yoast TV. You know it? Yoast used. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, it it's not really popular, and my question is why? Because uh, it it covers all the things you just said, but it's it's not a big like YouTube. That's a good question. I think that uh, last time I heard about Yoast was that they had technical issues with making it work on all different platforms. That's one thing. But you know, there's one thing about what's called the long tail. You, you guys familiar with the long tail? Okay, Chris Anderson wrote a book called The Long Tail before he wrote the book called Free. Right, and long tail says that you can make money by selling unknown stuff. Okay, Amazon sells about 35% of what they sell is unknown books. But here's the thing about the long tail. This is the used problem, right? You cannot just sell the tail. Right? It's like a dog without a head doesn't walk. Right? It's, just a, it's just a tail. Right? A tail by itself doesn't walk. You need the body and the head. Okay? So anything in media, the thing is that many people know only few things. So until that changes, you've got to have the whole monster. You've got to have the whole dog, not just the tail. Right? The long tail is real, as Amazon has proven. But if Amazon only sold unknown books, nobody would go there. So this is the time that we're in this convergence between the broadcast world, which is all about hits, you know, American Idol, X Factor, whatever, it's all about large things, and then the broadband world, which is about niches. 
Okay? The thing is, however, if you start today and you say, I'm going to start a website where we have all unknown musicians, unknown writers, unknown filmmakers, right? you don't get to build the audience in the same way. Right? You need to have larger platforms. So this is why YouTube and Facebook are important. Right? Uh, use in particular, I, I don't have an update on that, but I think that's one of their problems. Another question. Okay. Come on, get to it, people. This is your chance. First Frank, and then I get to you, right? Okay, uh, I'm well checking I here. I can uh, ask you to get a question that I asked him yesterday also, but I was Do driving you always to Amsterdam, wear black? No. so okay. <laughs> probably uh, didn't hear the answer. No. Uh, there's so much content that's created, and you say that curation will become enormously important, but what's the value of the content that we create? Because uh, we take pictures today, we uh, Twitter it, and tomorrow nobody's looking at it again. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, first you have to define what content is, right? And today what, what content is, is you may make a movie, then you have a million people comment on it. Right? And those comments and ratings become content as well. Right? They're essentially the same sort of level they're called meta content. Right? So you have content about content. And that becomes key in finding it or actually spending attention on it. Right? It's like recommendation. Like YouTube, 75% of YouTube traffic comes from links. Right? People send links to each other. You don't see posters by the side of the road saying watch videos on YouTube. Right? That's not needed. So that's, that's how they drive it. The value of content, I think, ultimately, of course, because of the noise, what's really good is more important than ever before. Right? It's not the noisiest that's the most important. I think basically it's Darwinism, you could say. Right? It's survival of the best or the, you know, not the noisiest. I think what we're seeing now, and this is going to get much, much worse. I mean, three billion people are coming online in the next five years. Right? Africans, Chinese, Indians, Indonesians, right? Brazilians, and they're all publishing stuff as well. Right? So here's the key question. Uh, are you going to listen to 60 million songs, or you want one of your Facebook friends to tell you about a cool band in Brazil? Right? That's the mechanism of recommendation and curation. That's where the money is. The money isn't in getting 60 million songs, but six songs. Right? And this is also, I think, to be one of those six songs. That's the challenge, right? uh, to create your own network. But uh, Seth Godin has written a great book about this called Tribes. Right? It's all about tribes. Okay? If you're in a band, or if you're an author, or if you're a programmer, or whatever you are, if you're creating stuff, you need a tribe that says, I'm for this. And the tribe is usually 150 people. Right? When you have this tribe, they will talk and, and tell their tribe members, and it spreads like this. That's how you get things done. Right? That's the human effect, and that doesn't change on the web. You can't have a tribe of uh, 1.5 million. Right? It has to be human tribe. Right? We have time for more, two more questions, I think. One over here. You can also tell us who you are, if you like. I'm John. Um, there are now 700 million Facebook users and uh, a couple more people on the planet. And do you think they get isolated from the world of because the advertisements are only focusing on the social networks? And yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, th th there is a danger in a in a seclusion, you know, because we're only connecting to friends and we don't pay attention to those that are not friends, right? That is a potential problem. However, if you look at the past of mass media, if you're talking about lies and deception, right, that's what we've had with television, right? I mean, clearly, the most deceptive and lying medium we've ever had was television, basically. And look at the weapons of mass destruction, right, that we were all thought were real. Everybody else did, too. On the web, this can't happen. Right? So the benefit on the web is basically it's going to be almost impossible to lie about the most single small thing. Because basically, all it takes is just to look it up. I mean, if there's a thousand people looking up whether that's correct or not, within two seconds, you know it's not true. I mean, if I told you I played with the Rolling Stones, it doesn't take too long for you to look this up, apart from the fact that you already knew this. Right? But now it's basically becoming impossible to lie on the web, which is a benefit of the web. But I agree with you that there is a danger in the sort of club mentality right, that we may encounter on, on Facebook. But having said that, I think we're still only at the very beginning of this process. Right? Um, as I was saying earlier, my sort of top meme is this idea from the broadcast to the broadband. Okay? In a broadband world, we are all a lot more responsible. We have to be responsible. Right? We can go on Facebook and get ourselves fired. Right? Not a problem. We can just tweet and get fired. We can do all these things and, and get sued and fired. We have to learn this. Right? 
basically the internet is like nuclear power. Probably nuclear power, power is worse, right? But we have to learn how to deal with this power that we have now. And this is, we're all in the very beginning of this. That the whole debate about privacy, that's the same, same question. We're now public by default. And if we don't want to be public, we have to become private again. We have to do something. Right? So this is the key factor, I think, with all these <coughs> things, is that if we don't take this responsibility seriously, then we can get into deep trouble. Right? And Last question, yeah. I think. Last question, sorry. Hi, um, my name is Sirk. And I was wondering yeah, um, what you think whether cloud will physically... <laughs> Up there, no? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, where, the, where it will be. Yeah. That's a good question. You know, the I think basically what you're seeing right now is that there is um, sort of 10 or so companies who are competing to be that depository of the cloud, right? It's a little bit like FedEx, UPS, and, and, and all those companies that deliver things, right? They're competing and hopefully by competition will have them actually stay straight as well. But cloud computing is a long way from reality in that same sense, right? Because keep in mind that if the, the connection doesn't work, then you're without anything. Right? So today, if you're on the, air, on the airplane, you want to listen to Spotify, obviously it doesn't work unless you've downloaded what you want to listen to. Right? You have to be prepared. But this frame is closing in about 10 years. Right? So basically, at that point, we'll be online no matter where, every time, even in Africa, even somewhere else, even underwater. Right? So that's a question of time. Right? The cloud computing has several issues there that we can't get into here, but that's sort of where it's going. The most important part about cloud computing is, however, is the control of the medium that's changing. So cloud computing means that we as the user control what happens with our content rather than the depository controlling what we can do right, in a physical medium. That's all we have time for. What a shame. Um, thank you so much. Um, uh, audience, please uh, keep a look out for the future agency and also developments on the um, future talks by Gert Leonard. Obviously, follow him on Twitter. And um, May I make one? yes, of course. Um, should you forget, Gert will be here until about uh, half past four. Uh, he'll do another session, but uh, he'll be able to uh, walk around and answer your questions during lunch or during the afternoon. So he won't be going away right now. Okay, thank I you. I hope. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you. And to, oh, I don't need this one. Uh, to encourage him to do so uh, and answer your questions, I would just very, very quickly like you to, if you have heard anything in this talk or learned anything that you didn't know before and that it was worth getting out of bed uh, this morning for and coming here, just quickly stand up. If you've learned something or heard something interesting. Well, there you go. This is how you get a standing ovation, Gerd. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>